All right, here we go, Steve Rifkin. Welcome back to Vlad TV. Thank you, Vlad. It's great seeing you, man. You look good with the beard. Thank you. Thank you, man. And you know, when you you know talk about the Steve Rifkin family tree and, and all the people that came out of it, Vlad TV and myself are really one of the branches of that tree, you know, because we actually had our offices in SRC for a bunch of years. Yeah, I think it was like, what, 2009 to 2012, something, something like, like that. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was really great to kind of see how things function at the highest level. You know, and that was really like a priceless time in my life, man. So thank you so much for, no, you know. Th thank you. We had some good time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, we had like a whole interview about your whole story, but, you know, I just want to concentrate on a few things in terms of what's happening recently. Okay. And, you know, one of the groups that you signed originally was 3 Six Mafia. So, you know, and they just had their verses. Did you watch it? I was there. Oh, you were there? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what did you think when all hell broke loose? I didn't think it was real at first. I was I, I wasn't on the stage. I really wanted to enjoy the show because actually, when Easy passed, and we went over to Sony, they transferred Bone Thugs through Ruthless, Ruthless through Loud. So we had all the solo records too. Oh, through Bone Thugs. But I didn't really have the, the closest one out of the Bone Thugs people was Crazy Bone. That um, you know, and Steve LaBelle really helped us a lot, and Steve and a woman by the name of Charlene Thomas really spearheaded, um, made the introduction for us with 3.6, and then Charlene really um, was like the a and and product manager for 3.6 yeah. at, at Loud. I mean, at the time, I mean, you see all these Memphis artists these days, but at the time, Memphis just had a couple of local rappers, and that's it. No one really broke out of Memphis before 3.6 Mafia. Exactly. But, I mean, I mean, I was listening to, I think, uh, Drink Champs, and you were saying how when you were just kind of touring around the South, everywhere you were going, they were like, 3-6 Mafia, 3-6 Mafia, 3-6 Mafia. So you already knew that they were hot down there. The other reason, and I, you know, I told this to Juicy and Paul the other day, the other reason why I really wanted relativity, because we had the West Coast, you know, we had the Licks, we had Exhibit, and we had some other acts that didn't do that, that great. You know, and then in New York, we had Woo, we had Mob, we had Pun, um, Dead Prez, Flex, you know, and when I saw what Master P was doing, it, I mean, it was br was brilliant. Yeah. And I was like, I got to, I got to see this with my own eyes. So closing in on the holidays, it was right before Thanksgiving, like three weeks before Thanksgiving. And I just went on a tour bus, and I didn't come home until uh, two days before Christmas. I came home for Thanksgiving, then went back on the road, and, and we stayed on the road till Christmas. I mean, when you signed Three Six Mafia, they blow up right away. Like, what was the first single? They, 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 they were buzzing. They, the first single was Tear the Club Up. Tear the Club. Well, yeah, that's what I thought. Right. Yeah, because I remember there's a commercials. Like, I remember on Video Jukebox and yeah. everything else like that. Yeah, and when they came out, it was, uh, I mean, it was interesting. I mean, they were named after the devil, <laughs> Three Six Mafia. It, and it was a bunch of people in the group, right? I mean, it was, it was Paul and Juicy, but then- Paul and Juicy you had uh, Gangsta Boo, Crunchy, Crunchy Black, Black, some- I forget who passed. Um, uh, Lord Infamous and uh, Koopsta. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but we only really dealt with Juicy and Paul. And yeah. they were the owners of Hypnotized Minds. Yeah. I mean, when you saw the the fight kind of break out. <laughs> you know? I mean, I it brought a smile to my face in a, <laughs> in a, in a crazy way. Out of all the artists that, you know, what that Versus is doing, it had to be one of mine. You know, just like, um, but you know, what Swiss and Tim are doing is just really incredible. And the whole Triller family. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I was really thinking about it. It really, I think, took a page from like, you know, Jamaican sound clashes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? How, how, you know, you'd have like, these big DJ crews get together and play dub plates and then have the artists come out, but they really took it to a whole different place. And now it's become really like the place where everyone really. Yeah, I mean, it's culture and it's driving streams. I mean, it's literally the, it is the forefront of what's going on in culture right this second. You know, and I just interviewed Project Pat, you know, and who was signed to Loud as well. And he was talking about how at the height of his success, he caught a gun charge. And then he had to go to prison for four years and I'm catching a Fed case. <laughs> In, in the process and everything else like that. And I talked to him, I'm like, why, why are you carrying around illegal guns when you're now a certified 
you know, a rapper, like on a major label, like Chicken Head had just dropped, I think. You have, you you know, sipping on some scissor, Chicken Head, you know, 3-6 Mafia is doing crazy. Um, why why carry an unlicensed gun during that time? Well, I'm going to say this again. I'm thinking like a criminal. You know, mm. like, when you think like a criminal, you don't think like, you know, I'm seeing the money. I'm moving smooth. But see, in my brain, you got to think now. I'm, I'm, you know, the devil got me thinking I'm smooth anyway. You know, and then I'm a listen, listen. A criminal don't think like this. A criminal, I don't have no beef with nobody. I'm not in tour with nobody. But in Memphis, everybody getting robbed. So I got some money now. Some money, money. So I'm thinking, well, I might need to carry this strap. Then I said, well, I might need to carry them two straps. I'm going to the north side. That's a little bit more dangerous. And Chicken Head just, I remember the day like it was yesterday. We wouldn't, and this is when there was radio. I mean, there's still radio, but like yeah. when radio was right, we already had the streets in the South on lock. We went for ads. We were the number one most added re record at Urban and, um, and Crossover. And then I wake up that morning and Juicy's calling me. He just got arrested on this gun charge. And it was a, not just one gun. It was a lot of guns. He had a few guns. Okay. Yeah. He didn't mention that part of the interview. <laughs> okay. I mean, and how do you really, you know, as a, you know, and you've always been like a, a CEO that's not really like a typical CEO. You've always put the artists first. And, and you've always kind of dealt with, you know, some of the nonsense and some of the craziness that comes with, you know, dealing with certain rappers and so forth. But you never, you know, a lot of a lot of labels will shy away from that. A lot of CEOs will shy away from it, but you never did. There's no reason to. Hmm. Um, you know, but, but well, I mean, there is a reason to on a business level. Because, you know, once again, like we talk about the Project Pat situation, you've spent all this money on Project Pat and everything else like that. And then boom, four years gone. Can't do any promotion, can't, can't do any pro, you know what I mean? Can't go on a tour. Like you well, know, so he he, he was he was losing the money, right? Uh, with the with with the tour. Um, but you know, m my thing is always, I'm going to treat you how you treat me. I'm going to show you the the most respect. I'm going to give you my word, and that's you know. And then once you know, I can't trust you. Then there's there's really no relationship. And if you if you can't trust me, then the, the, there's no relationship. But I'm you know I'm gonna fight and fight and get you whatever you need and break you. However, I need to break you. Mm -hmm. And and that's really my philosophy. I never looked at myself as a CEO. I just always looked at myself for signing this artist and this artist is believing in us. We have to go out and break the artist. Yeah, and not take no for an answer. And be willing to take chances and and listen. I mean, when you talk about all the artists, like all the major artists that, that have been on Loud and SRC, like everyone always speaks highly of you. Um, but have you ever had a situation where, you know, with a successful artist, that things just went bad between you and them? It didn't go bad, but it, dead press. Dead press, okay. Um, you know, they were they were young and I was sensitive. Like, I couldn't believe, like, I had a, a relationship like this with who? I had a relationship like this with with uh, Mob. With, same thing with Pun and Joe, Flex, everybody. And they just, I'm not saying they didn't like me. They didn't trust you. They didn't trust me. Yeah. And I, and I, and I, and when I'm saying I was sensitive to the fact, I, I took it personally. So that's um, that's really what it was. But you know, when we did our twenty-five year, you know, right, right before the world got shut down with with Corona, you know, me and M One sat. M One has been to my house four times during the whole virus, mm -hmm. and we're great now. And you know, and apologies, and just not even apologies. Like they could have been my biggest group of all time if if we were in sync. Huh. So, and, and I remember you talked about how, you know, Dead Prez's hip hop, you feel is like one of the top five songs of all time ever yeah. of any genre with the, you know, you're talking about Michael Jackson and the Beatles. And I mean, 
Jay Z. That Eminem. record. That that record came out what ninety eight. Yeah, still being so, played. I mean, it's still relevant for what it's what it what they say how it how it sounds. Yeah. So. And and again, that's just my personal taste. But if we were in unity, they would have been bigger than Wu. Dead press would have been bigger than Wu Tang Clan. Wow, that's a big statement right there. But they only really had, I felt like, one single. That's all they wanted. I mean, if you li really listen to the album, Mind Sex um, was an incredible record. They had a, re I forget the name of the record, but they had a record with Loose Ends that was ridiculous. Uh, yeah, man, I, I love that song. I, I absolutely, I absolutely love that song. And uh, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, it just kind of shows you know, how things can go but, different ways. But you know, v sorry for cutting you off. Okay. They had records that we couldn't put on the album that were better than hip hop. Really? But why? They couldn't, I mean, B samples? B or? No, not samples. BMG would not let us, would not let us um, put the records out. It was talking about shooting a cop. Killing a cop. Oh. Well, remember Ice-T put out Cop Killer yeah. with a body count. It caused an uproar, but they still put it out. Yeah. But and B then I think they got dropped from the label afterwards, yeah. actually, to come to think of it. But, but yeah. Yeah, BMG. Like, BMG I, I went to war with BMG. That's one of the reasons why I left to go to Sony. Aha. Okay. Well, one thing I never realized until kind of near the end was that you were actually DMX's manager. Yes. Okay, so how did that relationship start? I went to one of Kanye's um, Sunday service. Okay. And he grabbed me, he goes, DMX is here. He's performing. And I met a guy by the name of Pat Gallo, who was managing him. And um, I called Pat the next day. I said, I could really help you with this. Hmm. He goes, we're starting our tour. Can you meet me in New York in the, in the next few days? I fly to New York. And um, Pat brought me in to be his partner. Okay. And then um, with that, I met X at Coachella when he did Sunday service again. We got the dog in the shot now. Right, <laughs> you were hearing the grunting recently. <laughs> That's where it come from. Beautiful uh, bully, by the way. Uh, okay. So, so DMX. So you go out to Coachella. We go out to Coachella. And we sit down and talk. And um, he, he told me what he wanted to do. And um, I said, I can make it happen. And it was he wanted to resign with Def Jam. Hmm. And this is when Paul and Rich were at uh, Def Jam. I called Paul, Paul Rosenberg and Rich Paul, Isaacson. Yeah, Paul Rosenberg and Rich Isaacson right at Def Jam. Um, I called Paul. I said, I'm coming in and let's take a meeting with um, with X. And Paul is, you know, one of the biggest hip hop fans of all yeah. time, besides him managing the biggest artist in the world. Right. But, Eminem. Yeah. Okay, and I remember there was a, was it HBO? Came out with a documentary recently yeah. on DMX. Yep. And uh, it showed the shot of you guys signing the deal. And DMX clearly did not give a shit what was in the paperwork. It seemed like he was just, just didn't care in, knew, in a way. Well, DMX is one of the smartest people you'll ever meet in your life. Okay. He knew the deal. He knew the deal. Yeah, because we went over it a few, a few times. So when I said, no, you're going to look at this again, I, I was doing it to just cover everybody's ass, but the deal wasn't changing. The, you know, Tim already, we were already on the third or fourth draft. And each time there was a draft, me and Tim s spoke to him for like 20 minutes and said, these are the things, how far do you want us to push in and, and not push? He was there every step of the way. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. And I, I remember like in the, in the documentary, you guys then pulled him aside and talked about all the various lawsuits and everything else like that. Yeah, and he that, was, he lost it. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was like just really upset in the elevator. I was like, oh, these bitches, blah, 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 blah. Like, you know. I mean, that's, I wasn't, I mean, he was upset. Yeah. I really wish that I knew that you were DMX's manager at the time. I had no idea until he was already in the hospital. But we actually had a, an interview set up with DMX. Who set it up, Pat? Craig. Okay. We paid $14,500 up front for this interview. And we waited weeks and weeks. We were supposed to do it in Miami. We were waiting, we were waiting, we were waiting. At one point I had to get Swizz involved. Swizz had to call Craig and was like, yo, like what's going on? Oh, okay, okay, we got it, you know, we'll do it. 
and then ultimately uh, X passed away. Wow. You, you I, didn't I, didn't, I didn't even know. You didn't even know. No, I'm not blaming you on it at all, at all. But, you know, I mean, obviously we never got our money back, but, you know. Um, Went to the kids. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, actually, what, what Craig actually told me was that that money actually kept X alive longer because it kept him out of New York. He was able to use that money to keep him up in Miami, and then they mm -hmm. went to Atlanta. You, you remember that whole yeah. the, the whole thing leading up to it and so forth. I mean, it, it is what it is. I'm not, I'm not tripping, but I really wish we had gotten that interview because I was such a fan, and his energy was just – it was just like nothing. Like, you can't even compare a DMX to anybody. No, you can't. It's not even, you know, I mean, you could take certain artists. Okay, he kind of got, you know, you could you could compare Nas to like a cool G rap, right? You can't really compare a DMX to anybody. No, nah, you know, he got operated on a year and a half ago. And when X was out here making the album, he called me up. He goes, can I come to the crib? I go, I'm not home, but I go, I'll leave the door open. And just, he goes, will the dogs be there? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, I really want to help Champ. Because mm. he was still, um, he has two back legs were paralyzed. Oh, wow. So he was walking and everything, but he was gingerly. And um, he came every day for like four days straight just to train and get his confidence back. Yeah. I mean, X had this love affair with dogs. I, I remember I interviewed Drag On, and we talked about this. And he was saying how when X used to, I guess, sleep on the, on the roof of some building, his dogs were like his security because he was so broke that he, I mean, he was homeless and he didn't have any friends and the dogs like protected him. He used to, uh, you know, um, he used to uh, sleep on the roof and stuff like that, you know, you find something? Yeah. And sleep in peace because he knew that dog was right there. So let me know, let me know, let me know. Like those that knew he was up there or try to crap up or just try to do whatever. That dog was up there, and he never really had it. Aha. Yeah. So it was like his protection, his, his bodyguard, yeah, basically. Protector. Yeah, uh -huh. it was his protector. You know what I'm saying? And he built this sort of relationship with nah, the dogs. He, he would literally, he would go to Bristol Farms, bring back a turkey sandwich, and he would get one for the dogs. Mm. And and that's, and he got, his name is Champ. He, he got Champ's confidence back. Wow. That's crazy. What do you think was your greatest moment with DMX? Getting him to um, back out to LA to work with Swizz. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Swizz really, really loved DMX. I mean, with Swizz, he's already wealthy. You know, he don't, he's not working with DMX because there's a, you know, there's a dollar amount at the end of that because he really wants to work with DMX and all the magic they created together. No, I mean, it was true love. It was true love. It was, it was literally brotherly love. No, exactly. And, and like I said, when I was trying to get this interview back on track, me and Swizz hadn't talked in years. I hit him up. I was like, yo, I got something important about X. He called me up right away and I explained to him the situation. And it was like, literally, Craig called me back like an hour later. Like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get to do the interview. That was all Swizz, man. Um, So... Here you are, you're working with DMX. He is back in the studio with Swiss. He's trying to work on his album. He's moving around still and, and doing, you know, I guess some shows and so forth. Then he comes back to New York. And from what I understand, that was the last place that you really wanted DMX. Not yeah. you personally, but. No, everybody, nobody wanted him in New York. Yeah. I don't think he even really wanted New York, to yeah. be honest with you. Right. Because that's where he gets back into his old ways and everything else like that. Um, were you in contact with him before the heart attack? I spoke to him. That was, he had the heart attack on a Friday. I probably spoke to him that Wednesday or Thursday. Okay. Don't forget, it, it's Corona time too. So nobody's re really going out. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I was just checking in on him. Yeah. When you heard the news, how'd you feel? I didn't think it was real at first. I thought it was, it was because this wasn't the first time you know, um, so when Craig called, he goes, I'm on my way. He goes, I don't know how real it is. Yeah. Um, and then I remember calling Swiss, and I think Swiss was in Saudi Arabia, and he goes, have you heard anything? He goes, no. I said, Craig just called. Um, he goes, let me call you back. 
and then a few hours later, um, X's fiance called. Yeah. And she was hysterical crying, and that's when we knew how serious it was. You know, and I remember I talked to Craig about this, and what he was saying was that X had actually been clean for a while, which is why he was so heavy. Because a lot of times when you're when you get off the drugs, you know, yeah. like you start to put on weight because the drugs keep you thin. And he said that's why he was the heaviest he'd ever seen him. So it seemed like he was getting clean. And we don't really know what happened at the very end because from what I was told, like they were all at the house and they heard a loud bang upstairs. They went up and he was unconscious. You know what? I never got into it. I don't even want to get into it. And it was like, well, I, you know, I think we all tried to see what was real and get him the best doctors as possible. Yeah. I mean, when you finally found out that, okay, like, and I remember talking to Craig during this time, and, and I knew early that, like, okay, although he hasn't been officially pronounced dead, he's he's essentially brain dead, and, you know, they're just waiting for the family members to come. When you finally knew that, okay, he's not going to make it, how'd you feel? I was heartbroken. I was heartbroken. And then, you know, these people um, started saying he was dead, he was dead, he was dead. And granted, he might have been brain dead, but nobody knew that. And I was just like, let him just rest. Well, not him rest because he was already brain dead, but let the family just relax for two seconds and let them fly in and let them not think anything, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's what I was upset about. And I remember going on Instagram and like, everybody, he's alive. Just let the family take care of what they need to take care of. Yeah. And then, you know, once he passed, a bunch of, you know, so-called kids started popping because he had what, 17 children or something like that? 16, 17. 16, yeah. 17 children. And then the fight over the estate and everything else like that. I don't, it was not really a fight. I mean, at, at the end of the day, um, it wasn't, no, it was always, you know, his three oldest kids that, I mean, it was never a fight. I, I think other people were trying to see if there was going to be a, but they couldn't, you know, you have to be over 18. And his three oldest kids were over 18. So it was, it was, it was never a fight at all. Yeah. Yeah, man, sad. One of the, one of the greatest ever. Yeah. You know, just. And a heart of gold. Period. And a heart of gold. Yeah. Yeah. I never really got, I, I interviewed him one time, I think at Power 105. And it was mm -hmm. like, I remember he was the only person that I didn't have to say or really do anything. I just pressed the record button and DMX instantly lit up and would just do everything on camera. He was just drawn to the camera and a natural actor. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, he was a triple threat. He was a triple threat. Yeah. I'm sorry for your loss, man. Thank you. Well, uh, the Wu-Tang series on Hulu, uh, which you're actually portrayed in. Number one, what do you think? Okay. Number one, what do you think about the overall series? We're now two seasons into it. I love it. You love it. I like it. I, I like it. I, I wish um, the guy who plays me, I love as a person. Oh, you know him personally? He came, he wanted, you know, he picked my brain on, you know, some stories, this, that, so on, so on. I just um, wish he showed a little bit more. I mean, but it's not his fault. I guess it was the director, you know, a little bit more energy or a little bit more passion. Yeah. He has the long flowing hair. Like, we're going to show a picture of you uh, yeah. back in the day. Because <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, that's not Steve. And then I'm looking over this picture going, okay, never mind. That's Steve. Because <laughs> I always knew you were short hair. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a dope series. Like, I feel like, I mean, in terms of my personal opinion, uh, Raekwon's character kills it, just nails it. ODB's Thanks. character nails it. RZA, not so much. And me, me and Ray even talked about this in our last interview, how like the RZA accent that the actor does just. He, so I think he kills it, but I think he tries too hard. That's what I'm saying. Um, I think he tries too hard. I, I thought every, I thought they nailed them all. Like each one, Dave East with meth. I mean. To, yeah, yeah, I, I can see. I guess since I already knew Davies, yeah. you know, before it was, it, that, Joey, that's a bit, but, Joey badass with that. I mean, the, yeah, that, yeah, that, that was cool. Ghostface, not so much, because I feel like the Ghostface actor is just so much smaller physically than the real Ghostface. You know, Ghostface is a real yeah. imposing kind of big figure. You know what I'm saying? So I felt like I'm just not really getting the Ghostface vibe since I've interviewed him before and everything. But you know, listen, they did their best. 
I loved it. Yeah. I, I didn't miss a show. You didn't miss a show. Okay. You know, there's actually a story me and Raekwon talked about this in our last interview is that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio wanted to do the Wu-Tang movie. You know about this? I don't know if it was true or not. I heard about it. No, I mean, I mean, according to Raekwon, there was actual meetings and everything else like that. Like they actually met with Leonardo and everything else mm -hmm. like that. But then when RZA came in, he wanted to do the, the Hulu series instead. Next thing you know, we met up in Beverly Hills. We met up with, with Leo's team, his production team. RZA was at the meeting. So RZA really took the meeting on the strength of myself. But also he took the meeting to see if it really was what I'm talking about. So next thing you know, we sitting there, blah, blah, blah. They saying, yo, we interested. This is what we want to do. Cause you know me, I'm I'm throwing out there, yo, we gonna, we gonna wanna have an all-star cast of people involved with it. You know, I'm thinking like, yo, would it be younger guys that'll wanna play us? And then eventually, you know, we would all play, we would all get in it somehow when it was needed. But the key thing was. RZA already had an agreement with the people he was already doing something with. So he was sticking, he was staying loyal to his friends. I guess there was more money in it. But, you know, me and Ray kind of both felt that a, a movie would have made a bigger impact. You know, kind of the NWA movie mm -hmm. did. I mean, what do you think about that? There was, you know, besides the movie, I mean, there was a few movie studios. Uh, Paramount wanted to do something with them. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, if it was making the movie, we would just be probably just start shooting the movie now. I mean, it, it, it takes two years in pre-production to get the script right, to get it, to get everything like that. And right. to, so I, I don't know. I think now, I, I think they could still do a movie. Well, I mean, after the series, I mean, so much of the story has been told to the series, I guess. Well, I Different. Know. Be a little different. Yeah, I, I feel you. I mean, I, I, I like the series. Like I said, I've watched every episode. I, I'm I'm really into it. Um, you know, and you know, Ray just wrote a, a book. Okay. You know, we did a whole interview around the book. I got to read the whole thing. And uh, you know, when you guys first signed Wu Tang, and some of this was really kind of covered in, in both the book and the, and the series, your offer was essentially the lowest out of all the major labels, but you allowed them to have solo deals. One hundred percent. Yeah. Why was that so unheard of at that time? What, the solo deal? Yeah, the solo deal. Because the record companies are so fucking greedy. Mm. Like, they wanted everything. And it was like, I managed New Edition, not for a long time, but for like a year, year and a half. Mm -hmm. And the group is really still bigger than the solo artist, right? Maybe besides Michael leaving the Jacksons, right? But if Michael did a record with the Jacksons, who knew what it could be, right? Mick Jagger's solo records were never as big as a Rolling Stones record. Right. Right? So I was like, as long as we have first right, we'll be good if we have the group. And, and, that's, and, that's, how I, and that's how I looked at it. Yeah. Um, and I remember Rich Isaacson and myself, we had to scream, rant, rant, and rave and say, like, this is unheard of. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Like, this has to get done. Yeah. This is a life-changing moment for me. Hmm. I mean, you guys had first rights of refusal for all the solo deals, though, right? Yes. But the only artist you got was Ray Kwan. Yeah, but that was just me and Rizza having a conversation. Okay. But you tried for the other artists as well, obviously. No, I didn't have the money. No, no because oh, okay. when Def Jam offered meth 175000 they just went gold. I didn't have the budget to pay for meth the man. Mm -hmm. And then um, Geffen offered Jizza like, 350 or 400 something i was like there's no fucking way you know and then finally when we went platinum um i had a conversation with riz i said we should really just go in together and renegotiate the deal your deal and i'm going to renegotiate my deal mm -hmm. and i ended up having not a fist fight but it's i threw a chair through a, a glass door yeah and I the heard about this. And, and the cops came and they arrested me <laughs> and everything else like that and it bit bmg in the ass because of um, what they, like, we could have got it, that we were $20,000 apart when I blew this fit. And BMG was holding steady, and then RZA saw what I did, he was like, we're putting everything on hold. 
And Rizzo told me that night, he goes, don't worry, Ray's still going to be with you. Let us just, you know, not play chicken, but let's just, yeah. you know, scam. Meth Man was coming at the following week. Meth Man scanned 120,000 the fir- first week. In those days, those numbers were, were ridiculous. I went up again. It was a Monday before the Thanksgiving, and I was catching a plane that night to Florida, and I, I blew another fucking fit. And sometime in sometime in February, um, we got the deal done. Uh, okay. Well, well, Raekwon did sign with Loud Records. Yes. And uh, according to the book, it was a $500,000 deal. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the dopest things that I learned from reading the book was that Raekwon decided after signing this deal that he's going to give Ghostface half. Who does that? Who signs a solo deal and then gives his man half? I mean, that was, I mean, what that whole crew, I mean, they all just helped each other. It was brotherly love. Yeah. I mean, when Ray brought up the idea, okay, because you signed a deal with Ray, were you trying to sign with Ghostface also? No, we we me and Rizzo already had the plan. He was okay. not, he was signing Ghost to to raise his shop. I was always going to get Ray in deck. Got it, got it. Okay, so you sign Ray, and then Ray tells you, "Hey, I want this album featuring Ghostface Killer." I, fine. <laughs> you were like, but that's never been done before. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's like it's whatever. I think we sent him to Barbados. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and then they went to Miami. Yeah, because they, they got into like some situations with the hotel. They they went to uh, to Miami afterwards. Um, what's interesting also is that originally, Raekwon wanted to call the album instead of only built for Cuban links. He wanted to call it Wu Gambinos. But then <laughs> a phone call came in from the actual Gambinos. Tell me about this. My father called me. Somebody called him, and so they that they heard that and they didn't want the name you know to keep that name out yeah the gambino mafia one of the five founders. i mean so that was i don't know like i stayed out of that and i and i told ray well i guess ray ray says it in the book or he yeah says, ray says it in the book yeah um, yeah basically you said like we're not we can't use this name and he's like y'all want it. like we cannot use this name what would have been the repercussions if you had used the name I wasn't taking a chance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for my for my father, you know, whoever called my dad, you know, my dad calls, he goes, I need to talk to you and Rich. I'm like, all right, hold on, let me get him on the phone. <laughs> he goes, no, I need you to come to the house ASAP. So me and Rich grew up in the same town. We grew up right around the corner from each other. Long Island. Long Island, Merrick, Long Island. And I'm like, what the fuck's the matter? He goes, I'll tell you when I see you. <laughs> he can't even talk on the phone. He didn't want to talk on the phone. So <laughs> um so we were actually on our way to the Hamptons anyway. I said my son Alex was maybe six weeks old, seven weeks old. And um no, actually Alex wasn't even born yet. That was a different time. Um and he explained that he got a call from somebody. And that they would appreciate if they're um, if they don't call the album Wu Gambinos. <laughs> I said, "All right." I mean, it was a, it was an easy conversation. It wasn't like you know I got to give the artist full creative control. And I think Ray got it and understood it. Otherwise, because if he didn't get it, they wouldn't have. We would have had an argument over. Yeah. Well, because there was a song on there called Wu Gambinos. Yeah, which was so it was okay. Uh, yeah. There's a song, but not the whole album. Yeah. Yeah, Steve Pops, he he was connected. He had a lot of relationships. So I remember me enforcing the title on Steve and saying, yo, this is what we want to call it. We want to call it Wu Gambinos. And he like, yo, I'm going to look into that. And I remember him coming back to me and saying, yo, it's not happening. I'm like, what you talking about? What do you mean it can't happen? Gambino men, what? We, what? He was like, it's not going to happen. Right, because your dad was best friends with Sonny Francis. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, Sonny. And, um, and, you know, Michael's been a, a regular on my show, you know, a few times. So we know that whole story. 
Um, yeah, Sonny's like an uh, was like an uncle to me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, he was a serious guy. He was a, he was a very serious guy. Um, okay, so here you are. Wu Tang Clan blows up. Uh, the first album goes platinum. Eventually, thirty six chambers. Yeah, yeah. Like I think a little under two. Yeah, right around two million. Ray's album blows up. Platinum. Purple tape. Platinum. Platinum. And then, you know, Method Man, I think it was Every, platinum. Everybody goes platinum. Everyone is, is, is going platinum. crazy. Right? And so, so the Spectre Deck was signed to you. Yeah. But then uh, I remember I interviewed him about this. And this was actually in the, in the series as well. The flood happened in Riz's apartment and his whole album got lost. Exactly. So the, the theory was we were going to. I wanted to do it. This wasn't me, Maddie, C, who was my head of A&R, and Scott Free, who was our co-head of you know, and said, let's get Deck, right? He's on cream, and he starts off with Protect Your Neck. And we create a little mini super group within Wu-Tang with Ray, Ghost, and Deck. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. So it never happened, right? And then um, this was what Maddie and Free wanted to do. And then, um, and I thought the idea was absolutely brilliant. Then um, the flood happened, and the rest is <laughs> the rest is history. A spectre deck was sort of a to me. It was always interesting because, like you said, he started off protect your neck. I mean, he started off triumph. Yeah. Like he's like, I mean, that's not on accident, right? No, he he's an. Like to this day, like I'm going to apologize to him. Like he got caught in between us leaving BMG and going to Sony. Hmm. And if he, or if I just had the patience or explained to him better, that album really was an amazing album. But unfortunately, they had a, it took forever to get done because they had to start, start from scratch. But you're talking about one of the, Probably the best leadoff hitter ever in this, you know. This is what I'm saying. Who never really got the, you know, the props and the sales and, and the love that, you know, that Meth got or Ray got or or even Jizza. Like, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, like he never, you know, or ODB got. Like, you know what I mean? He never had that big single. Really? No, he's never had a big single. No, he didn't, he didn't have a big single. But he was like, if you needed to get on base. Yeah. You're calling deck. You're calling deck, yeah. This is what I'm saying. I mean, I'm saying this positively. Like, yeah, yo, no, like, me, me too. And like I said, I, I've apologized to him, and I'm apologizing in front of everybody that watches Vlad TV. Yeah. It's like he got caught in that web with us leaving BMG yeah. and then going to Sony and then him having to make an album from scratch. Yeah. Well, the first album does well, and then all the solo albums, like I said, do well. So now it's time for the second album. But, you know, according to Ray's book, by that time, the Wu really weren't gelling like they were. Wu-Tang Forever album? Yeah. I, I'm, the album did great, but the making of it, a lot of the guys weren't on the same page. You know, to the point where Ray was even saying, like, dudes was saying that, you know, other verses were trash, like, to the guy's face. And you know what I mean? Like, people, like, you know, they said that when the album was done, half the people thought, Half of it was great and the other part was trash. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it was like they weren't really like gelled up the way they were before. I mean, is that is that a fair assessment from your I, point of view? I, I wasn't, I don't you know me for a long time, but you never really see me in a studio. Yeah, yeah. You don't you don't hang out in the studio. Like right. That. So I wasn't there for the creative process, right? And this is just me speaking freely. Um there were a lot of songs. And I don't think they really knew in depth how much it takes for a double album. Yeah. Yeah. So you're talking about, let's, I don't remember, 24 to 26 songs? Yeah. You know, songs. And, you know, plus snippets and everything else like that. So. Well, yeah. I mean, like, Old Dirty Bastard ain't even really on, on the album like that. Old Dirty was away. Oh, he got locked up. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, well, I mean, regardless of what, the members thought of the album when it came out, 
I mean, it broke every record. Like crazy. Yeah. We, they, we debuted number one in every country around the world. Every country. And then Triumph went number yeah. one. Yeah. I mean, it was a million-dollar video. I remember me and uh, Ray and Power having dinner at City Crab on 18th and Park. And um, he says, we want a million dollars for the video. And I said, you know, who do you want to direct it? He goes, I don't know. He goes, you have any ideas? I said, Brett Ratner. Right. Who did Rush Hour. Yeah. Um, and Money Talks. Yeah. Right. And a lot of other shit. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we hired Brett. You know, it was Ray's concept, pretty much. Um, and it was a million, I think it was like the first million dollar hip hop yeah, video. That was the first, yeah, million dollar video. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, and you talk about, you know, like, for example, like I talked to artists from the UK, like, they all say that that was the album that introduced, like, the UK to hip hop. You know, UK was fucking with rappers, whatever, but when Triumph, you know, came out and when Wu Tang Forever came out, that's when everyone was on it. And it just became a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah, no, nah, I remember um, me and one of my right hand, the guy by the name of Mojo Nicosia, but him and my brother were running promotion for loud. And our office was on Melrose and King, you know what Cookies is? Yeah. On Melrose there? We, we owned that building and that's where loud was. And we went to go grab a sandwich and we saw this kid on a skateboard with head down to his ass, with the scully on, singing Wu-Tang Clan ain't nothing to fuck with. And then, you know, we just knew. But I remember um, the night before Wu-Tang Forever came out, we were doing a, a bunch of press, and it was coming out at midnight, and we were doing Virgin Megastore on 45th and Broadway, mm -hmm. was doing this huge promotion. And I remember we ordered in Chinese food into my office. I go, our lives are going to change tomorrow. Mm, and it did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when Old Dirty Bastard ran on stage at the whole uh, MTV thing, you know, the Wu-Tang is for the children. That was Grammys. I'm oh, sorry, the Grammys. Yeah. Sorry. I guess he went to your house right afterwards. He was at my house before. We were celebrating. And he goes, are you going to the, um, I go, no, you know, we're not winning. He goes, what do you mean we're not winning? I go, they not, you know, it wasn't going to be televised. You know, we, we lost. So I said, I'm just going to watch it here. He goes, and he was upset, not necessarily that we lost, that he bought a brand new suit, every, everything like that. Well, from what I understand, I remember my old, you know, my Raekwon interview from 10 years ago, we talked about this. Apparently, that was Old Dirty Bastard's first suit ever. That was the first suit he's ever owned. And, you know, when you put on a suit, yeah. you feel some type of way about it. Like, <laughs> So my wife is making me dinner. I'm, wa I'm watching the show. And it comes on, right? And he comes on stage. I'm like, is this, like, what the hell's going on, right? <laughs> so not everybody had cell phones in those days yet uh -huh. either. Don't forget, this is 1997, 98, 97. Uh -huh. And I'm sitting on the couch. I have my phone, my house phone, a pager, and then my wife's phone. Her, her line is ringing. And the phone is going nuts. And then the doorbell rings. And it's dirty. He goes, how'd I do? What'd you say? I said, whatever you did, <laughs> <laughs> this is what you did. This one called, this one called, this one called, this one called. He goes, well, what are we doing next? I said, I'm going to get dressed and we're going to go to the BMG party. Mm. And the rest was history. The rest was it history. Is. Well, Old Dirty Bastard ends up getting locked up. And uh, I mean, from what I understand, he actually tried to commit suicide Damn while I locked know. up. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I forgot who it is I talked to about this. It might have been you, God. I'm trying to remember, but we, we'll, we'll go ahead and show the clip. People were saying that old, the old Dirty wasn't really the same person after he got out. You know, he a lot of people felt that something happened to him while he was in prison. Well, he went, he went through a lot, man. He, um, he was in the HDM with, my, with my, mother's, my mother's husband. You know, I don't know if he was HDM. But HDM is House of the Mad Men on Rikers Island. You know how it is, man. It's, HDM is a max. Maximum security on um, prison on, on, on Rikers Island, I mean, and um, he wowed out. You know, he tried to kill himself a couple of times. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, a couple of things. He did some things in there, man, that, you know. But he comes out, he's not the same person anymore. 
He's, well, he's much heavier. Before he comes out, I forget the name of the place, but it was around 3,000 people were doing a show for the third album, our first album on Sony. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting on these stairs and I'm just reminiscing about my life. And um, I have a plane waiting for me to leave after the show. So now I'm flying private, this, that, so on, and so on. And across the stage, I see a woman. And I'm like, wow, she that must be Dirty Sister. She looks just like Dirty. And she's walking closer and closer and closer. And she's going up the stairs. And I move to my right a little bit. And um, <laughs> he goes, you don't say hello to an N? Says the N word. And I look, and it's Dirty. Where... They, he broke out of jail. And he's dressed like a woman. Yeah. To get on the stage, takes his clothes off, gets on the stage. The place goes crazy. Wait, wait, wait. The old Dirty Bastard broke out of prison? Yeah. And dressed up like a woman. Woman to whatever, but then got dressed. He had clothes on underneath. Yeah. Performed with them for one song. And he goes, I got to go. And he got caught in McDonald's in Philadelphia. Oh, okay. Oh, th- this is before he actually started his bit. Or, or he was- He was already doing he, his he bit. He was already doing his, yo, this is crazy. I've never heard this story before. It was all over the papers. Okay. Right, because I remember um, Ray talked about how Wu-Tang actually performed in Rikers Island. No, this was not, this wasn't in, this wasn't in jail. They did do that. Later on, yeah. I'm yeah, no, later this, on, yeah. I forget the name of the, it was on the, like, 36th and 8th Avenue, whatever. That's crazy. That's crazy. And ha- you know, Hammerstein Ballroom? What's that? Hammerstein Ballroom? Hammerstein Ballroom, yeah, yeah. Well, he does eventually get out. Yeah. And he's overweight and he overweight. wasn't the same. Wasn't the same. I interviewed his son, ODB Jr., and he told me like just the saddest story. He said that um, the ODB invited him to the studio sat him down and said, you're going to watch me get high. And got high in front of him and said, don't do this shit. And then a couple hours later, he overdosed and died. I didn't know his son was with him. Because this is the shit you don't want to do. But he, he made him watch. And, and that was his son's last memory. So you actually got to hang out with ODB in the studio with the rest of Wu-Tang. Uh, we was kind of hanging out. He was smoking a lot of drugs. <laughs> so he got it. The last time he was here, he got as high as he could ever get. And how soon after that did he pass? Uh, That night. <laughs> he got as really? high as he could ever get. And he told me to sit there and watch him. Eye to eye. We did that. And then that was it. When you heard that ODB passed, how'd you feel? I was in New York. I ran right to the studio to be with Riz and Divine. His body, I guess, was still there, right? His body was still there. So you actually got to see him? I didn't want to see him. Oh, you didn't want to see him. Yeah, I don't blame you. Yeah, sad, man. Sad. One of the one of the truly originals. I remember you guys told me that he actually, what I never realized, he actually kind of based his shit on um, Biz Marquis. That was his actual rap idol. And you, you, could, you can kind well, of you, see you it. You can see it. You can kind of see it. Now, we, now I mean, I never... Noticed that until just now. Yeah, but now that I say yeah. it, you see what I mean? One hundred percent. But he he definitely went a very different direction than than Biz Marquis. Um Mob Deep, you signed them as well. Um when you find out the prodigy died. How'd you feel about that? I was heartbroken. I was um I was in Florida. My daughter was taking her road test. And um, she was living in LA, but she could get her permit quicker in Florida. You do everything quicker in Florida. Although she lived there, you know, right? I'm joking. So so the phone's ringing and it's Rich Isaacson calling me. And I'm not picking up because I see Caroline just parking. She was taking her road test. Mm -hmm. And I see her parking the car. So me being a dad, I'm watching and Rich keeps on calling. So I knew something's a matter, right? So I'm like, hey, let me call you right. He goes, 
prodigy passed. And as he said passed, she walks in with like, I, I passed, you know, mm -hmm. she passed her road test. And I just sat down and I just started to cry. And, um, I, I mean, I was, I was fucked up. Yeah, I mean, Mob Deep. Ooh, you talking about the duos and hip hop? I, I can't think of anyone at the Mob Deep level, honestly. A duo? Nah, can't think of it. Can't think of anybody. I think the closest is EPMD. Yeah, but I would. I think I would put Mob Deep. Yeah, I, above, I, I, yeah, above, I above mean, those two, and I, and I love EPMD. What about, like, you know what, what, I mean? what, about what about Run DMC? I think if you look at different but longevity you know run dmc got bigger than mob deep at their height you know walk this way and so forth but like i almost look at run dmc as more of a pop group in okay, a way fair, fair you, you see what i'm saying you know with, with them working with aerosmith and stuff like that like when i look at mob deep like they remain the they, same they kept mob the, deep yeah. really to their you know you know to Prodigy's final day, you know, Havoc is still, you know, Havoc got a new project with like Styles P, like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like they're, they're that gritty New York, no sellout, this is what we do, take it or leave it. 100%. You see what I'm saying? Authentic, Queensbridge, grimy, you know what I mean? Like that, that, that really, that puts you, you know, from their first video of, you know, Shook One's part two, wearing the Hennessy shirts, like. Spelled wrong. Spelled wrong so you wouldn't get sued. <laughs> Yeah, man, uh, Mob Deep, man, one, one of the one of the the great groups out there, man. I actually got to interview Havoc. Havoc did his first interview after Prodigy passed with me. Oh wow! And that was just like a special special moment for me. You Havoc, know what I mean? Havoc has an amazing soul. He does. Very very good dude. Very good dude. Um, out of all the artists you signed, though, was Akon the most successful? They kind of sold the most. There you go. Um, the most successful was three six. Really? In terms, of how do you really the P and L, right? Uh. So um, they didn't want a lot of money. They did all their own production. They did their own production. Mm -hmm. You know, they had a fifty fifty deal, um, and everything they touched went <laughs> two million. Yeah, but Akon sold the most. Oh yeah, Akon was the biggest artist in the world. Yeah, but but he, he Akon became expensive <laughs> in terms of what? Um, making the albums. Well, how many albums did he have on Loud? I mean, on SRC. I mean, we had three, 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 and there was a fourth that never came out. Yeah, I think that would have kind of kept the company going longer. No, you know? I was leaving. No? Oh, no. you were leaving anyways. I, okay. I was I was leaving anyway. Okay, but I remember being at SRC with you. And we were all waiting for Akon's album. Yeah, like, remember I remember mean, we'd I, have these conversations. Yeah, I traveled the world to to get the album. We did presentations for London, for Japan, for Australia, but never came out. It still hasn't come out, actually. To this day, <laughs> this was what, like <laughs> ten years later. <laughs> but like the, the thing about Akon, like let me tell you, and I've said this before. Out of all the people that I've interviewed, historically, I think Akon is the most important in terms of his place in history. I mean, he transformed Africa. The whole Lighting Africa project, he went to China and got a billion dollar loan and put solar panels all throughout Africa. Like literally millions and millions of homes who don't have electricity now have it thanks to this one guy that you signed. And had you not signed him, he would not have, you know what I'm saying? Like, you don't know what, I mean, he was like a car thief. At one point, like, you know, you never know how things work out with people like, you know, but I believe them, you know, and that, you know, that was another thing. Univer when I said he'll be the biggest artist of my career, Universal laughed in my face. Hmm. And I said, fuck you. Gabi's wife was pregnant. I said, Gab, you handle the East Coast and me and Boo will cover the West Coast. His brother, yeah. And um, we had Boo, don't forget, we didn't have a video yet. For Locked Up. So nobody knew what Akon looked like. So we had Boo pretending to be Akon and giving, and we were giving, we, we were giving. <laughs> he looks just like him too. That, that's the funny part. We about were that, yeah. we were giving shows to radio, saying we're giving you an Akon show, and Boo would perform. Yeah, 
Oh, that's so ignorant. Okay. I love it. I love it. <laughs> right. And he became, I mean, not only did he become a huge artist, but he became such a huge A&R from T-Pain to Lady Gaga to, he's got his own city now, you know, and, and it's being run off his own, yeah. you know, it's cryptocurrency, own, Acorn. No, man, I, I, I love Akon. And, and, and the thing about Akon, and, you know, me, me and him, you know, did an interview together maybe about a year and a half ago or something like, He's just so cool and he's always the same person. Whenever we run into each other, like he, he'll pull me aside and we'll have like a half hour conversation. He, no matter how rich he's gotten, he's never been like, you know, his head never got big and everything he's accomplished. You know, when, when I got sick and remember him calling my son, my oldest son. Yeah. I said, your dad changed my life. If there's anything, if you need anything. Yeah. I don't know how we got Alex's number. You know, Alex was a senior in high school. And just, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and just, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it was, I, I gave it again. He gave me his word. I gave him my word. And we just had to do what we had to do to, yeah. to get it broke, to break. Yeah. I mean, and, and he was doing songs with Eminem. <laughs> yeah. Smack that. <laughs> I mean, was that? Was that the biggest song, the biggest single that? I don't that or I want to fuck you with Snoop. I don't know which was bigger, to be honest. Regardless, they were they were monsters. But, but yeah. at the end of the day, you know, I I was fighting with Republic at that time because mm -hmm. the album came out the first week of November, and I kept those two positions, number one and number two, at the Hot 100 radio chart, hmm. and on the pop side, and they were trying to sneak in and get something. I don't know if it was. The promotion guy would get a bonus. We got another number one record, but I was like, "Fuck them!" Like, and we kept it number one and two, and not trading off. They would trade off every other week. Like, yeah, yeah. You no, know, I, I remember, like in our last interview, you said something that I probably think about this once a month since since that interview. You said, um, "You know, because at one point SRC was just a promotions company." It's st so it started the, out. Started, started out as a promotion company. That was Stephen Rifkin Company. Exactly. But right. And I remember your dad sat you down and said, Call me back to the house. <laughs> back to the house again. The sit down, the, the famous, you know, mafia sit down. And he said, Here's the difference between a service business and an asset business. Like when you said that, 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 that struck me so hard because I'm in an asset business. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're building assets. I mean, you were the first one to make content. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying this for no other reason, but but the truth, if people like you or not, I mean, you uh, I mean, you have a library that is going to be worth a shitload of money one day, and yeah. then if you decide to sell, great. If not, if you want to just give it to your kids, and they decide to sell. I, let me tell you, I have turned down the equivalent of publishing deals for my catalog in the in the many millions of dollars that I've turned down. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That you're right. It, it's a it's a it's a library of ten thousand plus videos that get added to every single day. And and yeah, like when you said that, I was like, oh, I never I never really thought of it that way. But yeah, you're right. When you have an asset business as opposed to a service business, you got to keep working for that service. You got to yeah. keep doing new services, to and keep you make it going. and you make the money as you sleep. Yeah, which is how you transformed your business. And I guess loud one from a three thousand dollar investment. In 1992 to 100 million in sales in 1999, seven years. That's crazy. We're not doing 100 million, huh? <laughs> I mean, Vlad TV is not doing 100 million. We're doing well, but not 100 million. Well, I mean, you really skyrocketed it. Yeah, no, it was. Um, what, what I'm learning now is it wasn't about me, right? It was about the team, the culture. Yep. Um, you know, I, I was blessed to really have just. I feel company-wise, we could have went toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody. And all I just ever wanted was to play in the same playing field as the big boys. Yeah. Yeah, I remember, uh, I think on, on Drink Champs, you said that uh, Quincy Jones taught you about private planes and Jimmy Iovine taught you about private chefs and drivers. Yeah. So you were really at the highest level during that whole era in terms of your lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, I would go to Jimmy's house every Saturday. He would have movie night. Mm -hmm. And he would have and he would invite a whole bunch of people and he would have a chef. 
and, and cook for us. And then he had a driver, which I never, Quincy had a driver too, but I was never in the same car with Quincy. It was just always meet me at the airport. Yeah. Um, and Quincy taught me literally about private planes. Yeah, no, I, I remember working at SRC and, uh, uh, what was your assistant's name? Was it Monique? Monique. Monique, yeah. I remember uh, she said something interesting. And I remember at the time I was relatively broke, you know? And she said, uh, Steve only flies first class. If I can't get on a first class ticket, he'll cancel the whole trip. <laughs> you know, I remember she said that at the time I don't think I had flown first class yet. And then once I started flying first class, I'm like, okay, I get it. Never mind. <laughs> uh, but I went from the Sony plane to flying commercial. Yeah. And, you know, at first, I went from, when I left Sony to go to Universal, I was still flying private, right? But I, that was coming out of my pocket. Yeah. And then my account called and said, what the, what the <laughs> fuck are you doing? <laughs> and um, yeah, so. Well, at one point, uh, you started a film company. The, that was during the loud days. The loud days. Yes. yes. And Paid in Full was the big movie that came out of that. Yes. Uh, Alpo just got killed. In Harlem, uh, Cameron, you know, played mm. played his role in the movie. Um, when you heard the news of Alpo getting killed, what'd you think? I thought about Dame. Hmm. Um. I, n I never met Alpo. Well, he was in prison. Yeah. Um, until recently. So yeah. I, you know, I didn't meet him, and I was just like, you know, that whole Miramax thing, you know, was just. They didn't understand. They didn't understand what we had, and they didn't understand that they just should have just let Dame do what he wanted to do. Right, because from what I understand, there's a lot of drama behind the making of that film. It turned out great, but I heard there was a lot of like roadblocks along the way. Well, Harvey was trying to control it. Harvey Weinstein, right? So, yeah. So, so it was like this. Brett Ratna gave us the Dame gave the script to Brett. Okay. We closed the deal. We had a three picture deal with Miramax through Dimension, which was their independent. Mm -hmm. And um, Brett gave us the script. And that was so it was like through a loud, it was like a, a label situation. Through it was a, th a three picture deal. They gave us a crazy amount of overhead. We hired somebody to run it for us. And then my brother became the co CEO to, to run it. And I just kept on. You know, they would be calling me like, he's screaming at everybody. I'm like, you scream at everybody. Like, let Dame be Dame. Yeah, Dame and uh, Harvey would get into it, from what I understand. Yeah. I heard, I, like, Dame would, like, show up at a restaurant, scream at Harvey, wine scene for that, everybody. I, I mean, I, I don't know if it's true, not true, or, or whatever. But at, at the end of the day, I would just say, like, it's coming along great. The script is great. This is all Dame. You guys didn't do a fucking thing. Let, let him be him. And just go through me and everything, you know, like, and that was, um, I, I really blame Harvey, like, you know, because they were such control freaks and, you know, like, what, what's the word that they use is culture vulture, you know, just like, I would get into it with them, but like, let him be him, go, th go through me, yell at me. It's like, let him do what he does. He knows what he needs to do for this. Yeah. I mean, whose idea was it to put Cameron uh, as one of the lead characters? Because Cameron all, had no acting all, experience whatsoever. It was whatsoever. all Dame. It was all Dame. Yeah. I mean, listen, me and Dame have had our, our differences over the years, but you, you, I can't take away what his accomplishments are, which nah, is it, paid in full, is to this day... A classic. A complete classic. I mean, you still see the main, the memes. You know what I mean? Like, if someone gets shot, next thing you know, like, oh, get shot every day, B, you'll be all right. Like, you know what I mean? That always comes up. Um... And, and it was such a, such an important film because you never really see, you know, it was a period piece, which makes it that much harder to pull off. I mean, when it was done, did you realize you had something special on your hands? Yeah, because people were bootlegging like crazy. Mm. So we knew we had a classic from the get-go. Yeah. Yeah, I love that film. I'm actually rewatching it right now. <laughs> I might you watch it I mean? tonight. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. Well, too bad. I mean, with the success of Paid in Full, I mean, number one, has there been any talks about Paid in Full too? Not with me. Maybe with Dane. 
Okay. So at the time, as big as that film got, no one ever talked nah, about it? No, because the, we were at war with Miramax. Aha. Uh -huh. So you had a three-picture deal, but only one film came out. Yeah. And then that was it. You just said, forget it. I'm not, I'm not built for this. Like, this is, this is a little too crazy for me. I was then starting to fight with Sony, mm -hmm. and I had to focus on the music shit. There you go. There you go. Um, at one point, you had a heart attack. And uh, I never realized how bad it actually got. You know, because people have slight heart attacks, but you did not have a slight heart attack. No. You actually woke up with tubes and, and the whole nine. Well, I guess you would actually flatline three times? Three times. So you died. Three times. Three times. When you woke up, how'd you feel? I didn't know that I died. I mean, the um, I woke up with that tube in your throat. Mm-hmm. And I ripped it out. Oh. And I fucked up my larynx. Oh, permanently? Yeah, that's why my voice is. Okay. Where you, it goes uh, up and down. Yeah. Um, and I have this stupid cough that just because of, you know, but yeah, I mean, I'm still dealing with the heart attack. I was supposed to, um, the whole month of November, I thought I was to have to go for open heart surgery. Yeah. And knock on wood that they found my heart's getting enough blood. Um, because the artery that I had the heart attack in is 100% dead. Yeah. How old were you at the time? When you 50, 51. 51. Okay. And you were heavier back then? Much heavier. Much heavier. Like, how much weight have you lost since then? 40. 40 pounds. I remember you had even told me. I remember you and I had a conversation. I guess you had like, Eating some lamb chops or something earlier in the day, or yeah, I had um, my dad just got out of the hospital with heart. He had a open heart surgery, hmm. and um, they were living in my house. I gave him my house, and I was living in my ex wife's guest house. Hmm. It was Christmas Eve, and uh, me and my daughter went to have dinner with my parents at my house, and I had a whole bunch of lamb chops, and then we were playing basketball um, at my ex wife's house. And the, yeah. rest, and the rest is history. Nobody, yeah, no. nobody believed me until uh, I guess the hospital called them. Yeah, no, I mean, it's scary. Like you and I were talking before, like like I had high blood pressure. I, I went to go see a cardiologist. My man, Sean Press put me up on that. He's like, yo, you mm -hmm. should probably see a cardiologist. And he put me on Crestor and was like, yo, like if you would have kept this on, you would have probably had a heart attack. You know what I mean? And then th that's what caused me to lose 25 pounds and go to, a, you know, I mean, I don't, I'm not fully vegetarian, but I went mm -hmm. more vegetarian because that's what he said. He's like, yo, go vegetarian, take these pills every day, and it'll, it'll if be I showed better. you my bathroom, how many pills I got to take. Yeah. I got to take um, two blood pressure pills. I got to take a um, cholesterol pill. I got to take um, something for acid reflux for all the pills that I take. An antidepressant pill. Really? Yeah. Heart attacks are real, man. And that, that's really the leading cause of death for middle-aged men. Yeah. Pretty much. You know what I mean? He's like, and, and usually, you know, I talked to my cardiologist about this. Usually most men deal with it after the fact, after the heart attack. And he's like, you know, he was telling me how lucky I was that I'm actually yeah. dealing with it beforehand. So if I went to the doctor. You would have known. I, I would have known. But you never went. And you had health insurance and everything else like that. There's yeah, really no just, reason. I was just scared. Just scared. Yeah. I, I remember when um, uh, I was at SRC with you, uh, you started seeing Sanal Lathan. <laughs> and uh, it turned into this whole kind of media circus and got into TMZ and, and everything else like that. Um, was that rough? Because you're not the, the front page guy. You're the behind the scenes guy. And suddenly you're, you're front page. Yeah. I think it was um I think it was rough on both of us. Um I wasn't used to it and I wasn't used to looking at comments and seeing like like and I didn't understand why it was such a big deal. Right, because you were you were separated at the time. Yeah. No, I'm not even talking about that we were definitely separated. Yeah. But I'm talking about like who really gave a shit about who who I who I was dating. Right. But here you are, 
now in the middle of all, I remember you even reached out to me. He's like, yo, Vlad, like, what, what could we do about this? And I'm like, I don't know. We could do an interview. We could, you know what I mean? Like, but I, I didn't want to do, an, in, but I didn't didn't want to do interviews. You just wanted just to go away. You know what I mean? I think, I think Russell Simmons spoke out on your behalf. I think Russell did it and I called 50. Oh, 50 spoke out as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was that a rough time? I mean, dealing with that? Yeah. I, I, I woke up one day and, um, like, I forget, I forget which blog it was, but it was like Steve Rifkin's now Lathan living together, right? And it was on, like, I'm like, where the fuck did this come from? Because we, you know, she's, she likes to keep it quiet. Yeah. I, I like to keep it quiet. And somebody, and I had no idea if it came from my camp, her camp, you know, whatever. Then, you know, three months later or four months later, or year, who knows, like, then another block said we were married. And I was just like, I'm not even fucking fully divorced yet. Yeah. Right, because then there's the whole home record thing. Yeah. This, uh, she wasn't uh, a home record. No, she wasn't. No, I she mean, wasn't. how are my ex-wife are friends? Yeah, so so now Lathan and your ex-wife are actually friends. That's amazing. That's actually amazing. Are you and Sana still still a thing or no? No. Is there I'm, I'm proud of her though. I mean, she's directing a movie now. She's in Atlanta. Uh -huh. I mean, we still talk all the time. She never had kids. Not that I know of. Yeah. You guys ever talk about that? Um, not really. Not really. I already have my kids. That's true. Yeah, that's true. So what's next for you? Because you're always like, I feel like whenever you and I run into each other, there's always some big corporate deal that you have. Is it, is it Triller is the newest one that you're, you're doing? The Triller, would, you know, we partnered up with Triller on the single of the week program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I got, to, I, I got this new label. It's called Spring Sound. It's named after my dad's label, mm -hmm. Spring Records. Nice. Um, my son and my nephew, who are my partners. Okay. And um, Alex is running the day-to-day -day of it all. And um, it's great. We got five artists that are signed, and we're going to be putting out a single a single of the week. We're going to do it every bi-weekly with mm -hmm. Trilla. Um, I want to say our first release will be hopefully either the second week of January or the first you know, week of February. Do you, didn't you buy back some of the rights to Loud or something no. like that? So, no, we had, when that Loud Music Group, uh, somebody wanted to license the name off me. Yeah. And then we really couldn't do that. But I said, just call it Loud Music Group and I'll help you any which way I can. But I always knew I was going to be in business with my, with my family. Right. Because I remember, yeah, Loud came back at one point. I think well, Loud were... came back, um, that was a few years ago. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, but it just, it, it didn't really work. Yeah, I feel you. But you did have the concert right around that time also, right? No, the, the Loud Records relaunch was two years before the concert. Okay, right. Okay. I, I'm, I'm getting my yeah. timeline mixed up a little bit. But, I mean, but you did have that concert. The it concert, was, just, was just one show? One show at Radio City Music. One show at Radio City. Right. How did that feel to really sit back and to look at your career and have all these artists, you know, Wu-Tang, 3-6 Mafia, Exhibit, Alcoholics. Um, did Akon perform? Uh, no. Okay, because it's loud. Yeah, okay, but, right. I, but I did ask Akon to perform as a special guest, but he was he was in Africa. Okay. Um, it was... um. But not only did they perform, everybody came to Buster perform, DMX performed, Mary came, um, Jada and Styles came. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a few, you know, but it was like yeah, Little Kim came. Um, yeah. It was the biggest hip hop show in three or four years. Yeah. How did that feel though, as the, as the founder? Of loud. I didn't have time to, you know, it's like when you get married, right? Yeah. You're at the wedding. <laughs> you're all excited, but, you know, you're too busy shaking hands and doing whatever they tell you to do. Right. So it's like, I couldn't, I wish I could have just sat in the crowd mm -hmm. and watched the show. Um, But I got the video, so I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with the video.
Oh, they could do a documentary around it? I don't know, the documentary, I just might show the concert all over again and, sh and, sh and, and, st and stream it. And maybe do some interviews with the artists that perform. Hey, man, I'll, I'll do that for you. <laughs> uh, I'll come in and do the, do the interviews. You know what I mean? You could have all the footage. Um, yeah, so we could definitely talk about that. Yeah, no, I mean, know, no doubt, man, because I'm part of the story as well. Like, you know, Vlad TV, like I said in the very beginning, Vlad TV is part of the SRC Loud story. You know what I mean? Like, we're, we're part of that in our own way. And although, you know, you, you never had any ownership of the company or whatever else, you know, we really came of age with, yeah, with but, you guys. But, but my thing is watching you grow. As you said, it's part of the the family tree. So that's um that's where we are. And, and there are so many branches of it, like I said, and and you know, it's almost like a I would almost compare you to a to a Dr. Dre. You know what I mean? Where I'll, like I'll take that and yeah, I'll take that. And although you're not a producer per se, what what you've discovered and the people that, you know, like Dre said that his superpower is finding an artist that hasn't really blown up yet and, and, and helping them get to that. And, and that's really what you've done over the years. You know, and now and now you got your son working with you. Let's bring him in. All right. And here we have your son, Alex. Did you try to go the same hairstyle your dad had when he was when he was your age? Or, or was that just by accident? No, <laughs> uh, he he was growing it out in the pandemic, so he inspired me. So I I, I grew it out, <laughs> ended up liking it. And it's here to stay. <laughs> there you go. Have you and I ever met before? Like, well, nah, this is my first time. I think, I think this is our first meeting. time. Yeah, yes. I think so. I'm trying to think if I remember like meeting as a kid. I, I don't think so. So I don't. He worked. We gave him an office out of SRC at a mm -hmm. university. I was just on the phone with uh, on the phone with Rich. He was telling me about it too. So that's crazy. Oh, Rich Isaacson. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's all like I said. It's all it's all interrelated. What, yeah. what we're seeing here, man. So so what's it like actually working with your dad and and getting in the same business that he was in? It's cool, man. I, I can't lie. Like, in my perspective, growing up, um, people would kind of, like, say to me, oh, you get this because of your dad or, um, you know, just, just things like that. So now that – so growing up, I always kind of fought the battle of, like, do I deserve this? Do I not deserve it? Whatever. And then I kind of just accepted that, you know, we don't really control what situation we're born into. I'm grateful and fortunate enough to be born into the situation that um, after a life he provided and the stuff he built. So I'm just grateful and embracing my life and what my life is. So now to be able to learn um, from him in a more receptive, like student way versus like, cause people like don't understand, like, oh, it's like Steve Rifkin, this and the third. And it's like, that didn't start clicking for me until recent. And it's not a disrespect to him and what he's done. Yeah. But people got to understand this is my dad. Like, yeah. this is my father, right? Yeah. So I'm sure, like, Bronny or Zaire feels the same about LeBron and Dwayne. Yeah. Like, this is their actual blood father. So it's deeper than just what he, um, like, what he's done in business and the things that I now am fortunate enough to have access to. Um, so now that it's clicking and I'm trying to do my own thing in music, seeing how hard it is to sell as many records as he did and do it time and time again and get multiple number ones. Now I'm in like, when it comes to work, I'm in student mode. So I'm just grateful just to be able to learn from him, hear the stories of his experiences and somehow just incorporate it into how I can now be an executive and push forward the legacy him and his dad started. Do you have a moment like the, that really stands out growing up in terms of, you know, meeting an artist or, or seeing something happen with some of the artists that your dad has had or, or anything of that sort? From like, if you could like specify like from just like, just bullshit or just like something serious or? Whatever, just, just the craziest, most memorable thing that you could remember growing up in a family like this. You know, because, you know, I mean, you watch like shows like Empire and so forth. And, and this is sort of like a real life empire in, in its own type of way. I mean, down to the, the concerts and the reunion tour and everything like. No, I'm oh, well, the, the tour. Um, guess the thing. I was so young. I wasn't alive for loud. Or if I was, I was so yeah. young. You don't even right. know what life is. Yeah. But SRC, you were around. SRC yeah. was what was lit. Akon used to come to the house, him and Boo. We would all play Madden. David Banner, we would play NBA Street. Um, but I think one of my more favorite moments was when Lean Back hit number one on 106 in Park. It was uh -huh. a number one video. That was, I was geeking out. I was like a little eight, seven, eight, nine year old. Um, 
But the coolest moment definitely was the live reunion at yeah. Radio City Hall because it wasn't just loud. You had DMX's last performance. Kim came out. Um, uh, Prodigy's daughter was rapping for him. Like, who else was there? Mary J. Um, just like everybody who was somebody, Buster, everybody who was anybody in that era really performed. So to be able to, to work it, but then also get moments of, I can also embrace this and see what it is and how, what it means to build a career, not a moment. Cause that's, that's 25 years later that you could still sell out a venue like Radio City. Yeah. Um, so that was probably, that's probably my number one moment. No, I don't know, man, because then when he was, when he was working with Ye, like we flew out to Wyoming, like there's moments, I, it's tough to say what's number one, but I don't know, probably Radio City Hall or any, any Kanye moments have pro probably been top of the top. Right. Cause you were working with Kanye in, in what capacity exactly? Cause I remember there was pictures that I saw with you and Kanye together. Um, I helped run his label. Good music. Good music. Yeah. Do you still help run his label? No. No. Um, but. Is there really a label anymore? Is there really that, a good music? That, I don't know. You know, whenever he calls and he needs help, you know, I'm a phone call away. So I yeah. will always be there for him. What's your most memorable Kanye moment? Because I know you have. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have memorable Kanye moments. I was only I mean, around him for like an hour. When we did this Wyoming event. Yeah. For the, uh, for the release. Of the album, Donda? No, yeah, yay, yay, yeah. yeah. and um, he called on a Monday. He goes, "I want to fly everybody out to Wyoming on a Thursday," and it was costing millions of dollars. And I was like, "I don't want him to pay for this." And I was consulting a um, a live stream company at the time out of mm -hmm. Korea. Oh, I remember this. Yeah, yeah. This, this is our last interview. Yeah, I remember yeah. this. Yeah. Um, and they wrote us to check. To fly everyone out. So they underwrote the whole the whole thing. The whole thing. With the power of Steve Rifkin. And uh, that was the one thing I've always really kind of admired about you is that you really had the corporate thing just a lock in terms of working with corporations and, and getting those big checks and everything else like that. Like I've, I've never been good at that. I've always been the content guy. You know what I mean? That's why I've always, I've partnered with Complex because they're good at that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But me personally, I've never been able to make deals or anything of the sort. And that's the one thing I've seen decade after decade with you is that you're you're able to to walk in those boardrooms and walk out with those big, big, big checks. Yeah. So that was um that was a little nerve wracking. I that bet. I bet. <laughs> Steve and Alex, man. Vlad, it was great seeing you. I'm proud of everything that you're doing. Keep on doing it. Thank you, man. And watch what he does. You I know, can't wait. Just um I'm enjoying, you know, being on the side and, and watching. Absolutely. And he lets me get my hands dirty, you know, once in a blue moon. That's what it is. Until next time, y'all. All right. Peace. Peace.